Larkin's uh, questions on the GRG group and what's happening in the UK. Um, the FCA there ordered the report in 2014 uh, into the allegations of 12,000 small businesses that it was meant to help. I'm quoting from uh, an article in the Financial Times. And then when the independent report uh, was leaked to the BBC, uh, that report is said to have found that 92% of viable businesses put into GRG experienced inappropriate action, such as unnecessary freeze, and only 10% of, com of the companies that were put into GRG to be assisted actually returned to the bank. These are figures from the UK. And as I said, it's a recent uh, report. Now, RBS then set aside um, last year £400 million to compensate small businesses. So if you're compensating the small businesses that were in uh, GRG or that were affected by what happened to them, then that in itself is admitting that you didn't help them, that they were inappropriately put into this particular scheme in the UK, and they were inappropriately then uh, dealt with. So if I relate that then to what's happening here, it is in effect the same thing. And to a degree, um, with respect to yourselves, this is a bit of uh, Groundhog Day, because it's, it's the same thing over and over again. So I'm interested in the aspect of the debate around GRG, which relates to the number of businesses that were actually put into GRG that were associated with other businesses other than the core business. What efforts were made by the bank to separate out the performing loans before you pushed them through uh, GRG and then out? Why did you not make an effort in those years to save the better parts of the performing companies and businesses that were in your bank, that had your, their accounts in your bank, before you sent them all off. It's like as if you just made a decision to bundle the good, the bad and the ugly into one basket and, and send them to GRG. Mr. Chairman, maybe, maybe I can, I, I can, I'll ask Andrew to answer the second question, which is about the efforts that were made in relation to restructure those companies uh, ahead of any, any portfolio sale uh, or, or so on. Um, but the, the one remark I'll make in relation to the FCA report, which of course I haven't seen and, and, uh, and, and which, has not been, which has not been published, is that the, the, um, the principal actions undertaken by RBS, which we are also participating in around the refund of complex fees and about the establishment of a new complaints process to listen to companies who feel like they were mistreated uh, or not treated properly at some way through the uh, GRG process is, is something that we are active and, and subscribing to and which Andrew, Andrew has already referred to. Andrew, would you, would you like to answer the other point? Um, so In answering the other point, Mr yeah. Blair, would you just elaborate on what both Senator Donnell and Senator Harkin raised in relation to uh, West Register. Certainly. You might give us some I, I idea certainly try. Um, in terms of just on the compensation amount, uh, which was the, the, I think the 400 million you referred to, Chairman, um, so that, that has been set aside in order to meet the cost of the program and also to refund com, uh, the complex fees. In the context of the complex fees, for Ulster Bank, I quoted some statistics earlier, the total amount involved is just over €1 million, Euro, including interest, and it affects 19 customers that we have identified to date, and we are very close to the end of that process. In terms of the, the point that you raised about uh, customers and trying to separate out customers uh, that had businesses with attendant other debt that may not have related to those businesses originally, but to some other activity, um, in many cases property. Um, during the period from 2008 to 2013, uh, I go back to the point I made earlier, which was that real efforts were made to try and support customers to do things uh, that would enable them to survive. Um, in a normal environment, 
some of those activities would have been to realise the assets that were creating the burden on those businesses. Um, in that period, the ability to realise assets, as everybody who who's, lives in the country knows, was extraordinarily limited, if not non-existent, for a period probably through to the end of 2012. And if you were outside Dublin, even more limited than that. And so some of the actions that would have been available to people in order to restore businesses to health were effectively closed to them. And that, that's the perspective that I'd have on this, which is real efforts were made to try and support people through to viability. The separate point which, which comes up in, in some of the questions that have been asked is that, that we then took a decision which was to restore the bank to financial health and restore the balance sheet of the bank to put it in a position where it could actually begin to su support and grow in the economy. We took the decision to realise those assets, uh, and by that I mean the loans, um, and we did that with the full knowledge of our shareholder and indeed the views of the regulators taken into account as a necessary step to make Ulster Bank a viable business, to make Royal Bank of Scotland a viable business. And that's why we did that. And we didn't, we, we didn't, not, we didn't not seek opportunities to try and separate businesses and give them a future. But when it came to the end of the day, we had to make, take steps to restore the viability of our own business, and we did what we thought was the right thing to ensure that we could remain a systemic organisation in this country. To your point about West Register, let me go back and be, be absolutely uh, certain of the issue about the directorship. I'm absolutely certain, as I sit here now, I never had a shareholding in West Register. I may have been a director of that company for a short period. I don't recall, Chairman, I will clarify that. What was its function? Uh, during that period? No, what, what was its function? I, as far as I can recall, West Register's function was to, to retain property assets. For but who? I, for the bank. Your bank? Yes. Ulster? Yes. So its connection then is directly to Ulster Bank? Yes. As far as I'm aware, the shareholding of it was owned by Ulster Bank. But Chairman, well, I really need to Bannon? be absolutely so clear. I, I'm not familiar with West Register in any, in any shape or form, so we'll be it's happy. part of your bank? Yeah, right. I'm, 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 not, I'm not familiar with it at all. So what properties does it hold then? I don't know, Chairman. I have no idea. I don't know if it holds any properties. So this, this West Register is part of your bank, and neither you, Mr. Madden, or you, Mr. Blair, know anything about it? I, all I said was that I recognise the company. I don't know what activity it has in it right now, if it has any. And, Chairman, all I can offer no, to you is... No, even back then, is even back then, whenever it started... What was, in the, what was the purpose of West Register? Chairman, I will, I will go back and I will establish the facts and I will provide them to you because I don't want to give you an erroneous answer. I, I think that's extraordinary that neither one of you know what your bank is up to in West Register. I, I, just, I find it extraordinary. And I, I can't pursue it anymore because neither one of you know anything about it. But we will pursue it again, and we would like a comprehensive note uh, on its function, its connection with the bank, the types of property it held, or how property was transferred to it, and then what was expected of West Register having had the, transfer, ha having had the property transferred to it. But I think it's extraordinary that you don't know. Uh, and, and I dispute the fact Mr. Blair, with you in relation to your efforts to restructure viable businesses. Because the correspondence that we have got, in, certainly I, in, 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 as chairman of the committee, I know other members have as well, regarding GRG, tells a different story. It tells a different story. Uh, and it, it is a story of uh, viable businesses mixed in with businesses that were in difficulty, not being separated out, and the total package sim simply being dumped from GRG out into a, a vulture fund of some kind or another. And that may have been a piece of work that you undertook to save your bank, 
or to better your balance sheet. But it contrasts, distinctly contrasts, with the action you've taken in relation to the trackers. You're talking about a bad time in your bank. Well, let me give you a bad time. Let me, let me tell you about this customer here on the tracker issue, which doesn't compare with how you dealt with the GRG customers. This person tells us that they overpaid our mortgage by approximately 400 euro a month. It's ongoing for the last seven years. They've struggled with their monthly repayments. And during that time, they had to assist their two children. They had asper have aspergers. They've gone to credit unions and banks for loans to support the care of those two children. The, the person says they've gone without food, without heat in their homes, without holidays. And the children of that family are suffering to this day. They estimate they're owed around 30,000 euro and more, I'm sure, from your bank. And you still haven't dealt with them. Now, I find that to be totally unacceptable in any society that the most vulnerable will be treated the way this family has been treated. And you know that over the last few weeks in the lead up to this committee, that the correspondence to the committee has peaked at an incredible high. And if I, which I did, examined that correspondence and just took from it the basics, what the correspondence is telling us is that your helpline is a farce, that it doesn't give the answers, that it doesn't give any comfort as to the time frame for dealing with the, the issue, whether the individual is in scope or not, what the compensation might be and the level and so on. It's, it's like as if you've just established this because the central bank says so. But the, the level of information is such that it's unhelpful because it adds to the frustration and anger of the person that touched the helpline in the first place. And lastly, in relation to helplines, I want to draw your attention to other pieces of correspondence which, which bear you know, um, a trend right across a huge number of customers. They have failed to deal successfully with your bank, even on the most basic pieces of information. So they've taken to employing either financial uh, consultants or people that would assist in that regard, or they've taken to um, legal representation. And in spite of that, your bank has not responded. You send out the same letters that are full of nonsense about what you're doing again and again and again. You don't answer any of the questions that they've asked. And in some of these cases, the person writing the letter tells us that the questions that they've asked have not been acknowledged, have not been answered, and that you're not dealing with the questions in their lives that are absolutely critical to how they plan the rest of their uh, uh, life and the rest of the servicing of their mortgage. Doesn't that stand now in stark contrast to how you saved your bank, dealt with the GRG issue, and then turn around and fail fail the ordinary citizens of this state that find themselves being pushed on over, all over the place. And they write to us just to get the basic information. Basic information. So I want to know what you're going to do to correct that and what you're going to do to individuals, fa individual families who find themselves in a particular set of circumstances where their quality of life is destroyed and where the children of that family are having to suffer as well. Will you give them priority if they write directly to you? Will you instruct your staff to reply? Will you give the frontline staff the appropriate messages 
to the questions that we are being asked as a finance committee to address. If you're so fond of your customers, you're treating them very badly. Can respond, Chairman? Oh, I, I would, Chairman. Um, <coughs> Chairman, thank That's you. That's the purpose of the meeting. Um, and I hope you'll give information to the customers. So, look, the, clearly the individual case that you talked about is completely appalling, um, not at all unique, uh, and it, it, um, it pains us um, to see customers in that kind of situation as a direct consequence of the actions of the bank. Um, I've apologised and I'll continue to apologise and say that we will make it right for those customers. Um, it's clear that you know, what we need to do in order to be able to restore the trust of customers is not only make up for the, what we've done in the past, so it's not about what we do to put them right, but it's about how we do it as well. It's clear to me that there's a lack of clarity and transparency in relation to what they can expect and when uh, and, and how we're seeking to, to resolve that. Um, I think there is clearly, based on your, your feedback and, and, and that of others, more work for us to do in being helpful and transparent and giving people answers in relation to Sorry when they can expect you. a response you, and what you, that... You know this. You know this. You're just talking back to me as if this was the first time you've heard it and you're going to do this transparency piece and all the rest of it. <coughs> I asked you the question, what will you do to address the information deficit on your front line and on the help line? I've asked you in relation to that particular case, of which there are many others, piles of them here, what will you do to prioritise these families if they should come to you? And then thirdly, will you please answer the questions that are put in writing to your bank by representatives of clients that are suffering desperately by the inaction of your bank to deal with their issues? In, in relation to the last issue, uh, I think we need to deal with each of the cases specifically, and there may be some areas where an answer can't be given because it's not clear. For example, if a customer asks what specific compensation they're likely to receive, until that calculation is completed, and I described some of the complexity of that, it's not, we're not capable of giving, giving a response in, in relation to that. I do think there is a need for us to improve the clarity around what we can say and when we can say it, and there's a need for us to improve the transparency around what the prioritisation process looks like, and therefore when individual customers can expect to find themselves in remediation. We need to do all of that in the context of the fact that there's, a, there's oversight by the central bank, and whatever we say and do and commit to needs to be something that they agree with, that, that, we're, that we're committing and doing the right thing at the right time for the right customers. Um, you know, and, and, and in addition, you know, all, we, all we can do is, is keep working as hard as we possibly can in relation to remediating it each of the individual Will customers. You those I, Will I, you give priority to those families whose children are even being affected by this, should they come directly to you? So, look, I, I hesitate to say that... Yes I, or no, I'll be fine. I hesitate to say that I can give individual prioritisation on the basis of people who write first. I think we need, we need to look at and, and understand and be clear about exactly what the criteria are for the, for the accelerated resolution, which are the priority categories and so on. You know, the, the ones that are at the top so of when our you, list. So when your bank suffered, and I, I'll come back to Deputy McGrath here, they want to come in again for questions. When your bank suffered, you took immediate aggressive action against the SME sector in this country by dumping them. But when you're asked to save a family in distress with special needs children whose lives are being affected, you can't even answer yes. When I ask you about the questions, you say you, you might not have some of the answers. Well, for example, why were we placed in GRG? What was the expected outcome? There are answers that you should know. You should know the answers to those questions. And you shouldn't have to get three reminders from a customer asking the same questions over again. And I have to say, Mr. Mallon, you shouldn't have come in here today giving us another groundhog event with all of this correspondence piling in on top of us. 
because you have got some of this correspondence already. You ask customers to contact a bank. You say in your correspondence, contact us directly. You give a phone number. When they contact the bank, the person at the other end can't even answer the questions. That's why people are annoyed. And they have no confirmation of anything. No definite piece that says we will deal with your case in the context of replies to the correspondence that I'm talking about. This may be correspondence to us here as members of the committee, but it's also correspondence that you received. And I find it shocking that in some of these cases you, you just don't give a straight answer. And I understand the complexities of this, but you've been at this for a number of years now. And I certainly would not be at all happy uh, with the manner in which you have replied to the questions here today. And I think you've, you've heard <coughs> what I've said. You've heard the questions that were asked. You're aware of this correspondence because it's copied to you. And I would like to know, by return, after this meeting, what you were going to do in relation to some of this correspondence. I won't press you further on it today, but I have to say it's appalling behaviour of the bank.